All right, so I just want to give you an update on my, my week. Last Sunday, uh, we left uh, after Sunday school, jumped on a plane, flew to Seattle, flew to Spokane. Never give yourself 30 minutes between flights when you get to Seattle. I'm flying Alaska thinking, oh, it'll all be the same concourse. Oh, no. If you've ever flown into SeaTac, uh, come up to the gate at one concourse, and my connecting flight is clear at the other end. I had to ride three trains to get to my connecting flight. Fortunately, I got there like two minutes before they started boarding. So it's like, yes, <laughs> I made it. Okay. Um, I was able to uh, reconnect with an old high, high school classmate and her husband. I haven't seen her like in 15 years or something like that. And uh, he and I are going to do a little uh, off-road motorcycle touring this summer if I can find somebody to take my spot so I can take a vacation this year. So uh, that, was, that was a lot of fun. And then got to spend a couple of nights with... Uh, the couple that they're in their 80s now have actually got to celebrate Norm's 84th birthday. The people who built Shiloh Ranch were Protectors Peak, which is a mission you know that, that we support here out of this church. Um, got to spend that time with them, celebrate their birthday. That was good. I spent two days uh, with Nate Harder, who is the founder of Protectors Peak, and uh, he's retiring at the end of the month. That's good. They are living at the ranch full time, and. We spent two days at the at the first responder first responders responder I can't talk first responder mental health and wellness conference. We set up a you know informational booth for Protectors Peak you know to get people to come and, and do retreats. Um, so, so there's some things that struck me it has nothing to do with the message, but I want to share them with you because it's important. Okay, so the this this mental health wellness conference is definitely secular in nature. Okay, but there's Christians in there. Uh, one of the presenters, the, the one who presented um, really kind of Dave Ramsey financial type stuff, he calls himself Financial Cop. That's his organization that he's got now. He's a, he's a retired police officer out of Texas. Um, he was obviously a believer. I mean, Nate and I picked it up on him right fast. And then he quotes a scripture right at the end of his presentation. So I was like, ha, ah, we do it. And uh, so we went up and kind of cornered him. I'm like, you, you're, you're a believer, aren't you? He goes, well, of course. I'm like, okay, good. All right. And there was another Christian ministry there um, with uh, therapy dogs and stuff like that. But yet, when we're listening to you know people tell their stories, cops and firefighters talking about you know post-traumatic stress and all that kind of stuff, and alcoholism, you know, and drug addiction, and you know failed marriages and things like that, there was a component missing from each of those testimonies, and that was spirituality. In fact, that should be the foundation of all mental health and wellness, shouldn't it? Yes. Right? Should be spirituality. Is that relationship with Jesus Christ is so important, especially in the first responder community. Right? Because if you do it for any length of time, whether you're a police officer or a firefighter, if you're a dispatcher, because they get to listen to all kinds of horrible things on the on the phone and the radio, okay, or you're working in corrections where you got to live with, you know, people that the cops have just arrested for 10, 12, 14, 16 hours a day sometimes, uh, it's going to have an effect on how you think and how your brain operates. And we need that spiritual foundation, and it's missing from this. So that's a little bit sad, okay? Um, so while I was there, I got to uh, uh, visit with uh, the first police officer in Moscow, Idaho, on scene of that terrible murder of the three girls and the guy in, in, that, in that apartment complex, or the house that they, you remember that one, the bad one, right, in Moscow? Uh, he still has the deer in headlights look, okay? I could see him kind of like, that guy's got the thousand yard stare. I know what it looks like, I've had it before myself, and he's got it. And so we got to talk a little bit. I got to talk with one of the medics that had responded to that, and I got to talk with a couple of forensic technicians, one of whom I'd known from my previous career, okay, who went down there and did some of the forensic work, okay? So I want you, in your time, keep these people in prayer. Um, there, that was a tough one, right? Some things you see, you just cannot unsee, and that's gonna be, that would certainly be um, kind of a watershed moment for those folks. But uh, anyhow, so that was interesting. So then on the way home, uh, as I'm flying back, you know, taking the long way home by flying to Seattle back to Redmond, I'm sitting next to a guy, and, and we get to talk, and then we get to talking about Spokane, Spokane Valley, where he's from, and it's where he grew up, and, and he's a water quality guy from the state of Washington. And I, so I told him what I was doing and what I used to do, and he goes, oh, do you know Marty Pinnell? Marty Pinnell and I used to work together. Uh, he was a corporal, I was a sergeant, and we had a good time. Right? And good Christian guy. And Marty's now retired too. And I was like, well, isn't that a small world? Okay, they're cousins. 
Uh, another Christian police officer, or deputy sheriff that I used to work with, who's now retired, uh, this guy that I'm sitting next to, he goes to church with him. Like, well, how cool is that? So very small worldish, all right? And then, of course, you know, a couple days after we get home, Galen gets this text message. So Galen had gone to a, a law enforcement wives retreat last October. I helped in the kitchen. Okay. She actually got to be an attendee. And this woman, the her, is was at that retreat. She's from Ohio. Her husband's a police officer in one of the big cities in Ohio. And he's got relatives that live in Sun River. And they were either on Crescent Cutoff Road or Willamette Pass or something, you know, heading that way or coming back this way. And and the uh, the uh, the older relative hit the black ice in a shady spot, wrecked the car. Right? And the mom ended up going to the hospital with a cut on her head and all that kind of stuff. They need a rescue. So I was like, well, that is such an interesting ministry thing, isn't it? Right? A, I was here. I had just got back from a dump run with Dave. We just hauled out the old sanitizer dishwasher thing. I just got back to my truck and gassed it up. I was talking with Brian at the gas pumps at the Highlander there um, when I had to turn around and go down the walk. So. so pastors do work more than just Sundays, okay? <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, now let's get to the now let's get to the meat of the matter today. We'll get to our we'll get to our passage here in a couple minutes. I'm gonna just uh, throw out a question. I want you to think about this. Maybe throw out a couple answers. What do our Christian brothers and sisters around the world face today? What do we call it? Persecution. What does what does that look like? Could take many forms, right? Mm -hmm. Jail, hurt. Jail? Mm -hmm. Death. 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 Slavery. Mm -hmm. Rape. All kinds of things, right? Loss of your uh, home, loss of business. Yeah, it could take all kinds of forms. Okay? Or it could just take, be getting picked on for your faith, right? I'm going to, I uh, pulled up some information from an organization known as the Open Doors. It's actually, a, it's actually, there's two organizations called the Open Doors. There's the global one and there's the U.S. one. Okay? I went to the global one. I want to look, we're going to look briefly at the 10 most dangerous countries in the world in which to be a Christian in 2023. Okay? We're going to start with number 10. We're going to go all the way to the worst. I'll just read some excerpts. Give us an idea of what is happening around the world. It's been happening now for 2,000 years, so it's nothing new, right? We, however, as Americans, we've been really pretty insulated from a lot of this stuff. We have, a lot of us have no idea what happens to Christians around the, around the world. And here we are, living basically in the lap of luxury, generally speaking, at least for the last 100 years or so in this country, and I think we've grown soft. I think for a lot of us, our faith is very weak, right? Because we get all upset when silly little things, right, don't seem to go our way. When we, when we think we're, you know, getting persecuted, it's only getting started here, okay? All right, Sudan, all right. Sudan. Current authorities are now forcibly closing churches and arresting pastors. Okay? That's in Sudan. I'm just reading a little highlighted excerpt. Afghanistan. Well, I kind of know what happened there. Christians never had it so good in Afghanistan whilst we were there if we, if we had the opportunity to protect them. We've left them high and dry. Christian converts in Afghanistan remain in grave danger and their mere existence requires they live in deep hiding. Hopefully some of them were able to escape uh, over to here and other countries, many of them were left behind by our government, by the way. In fact, you're going to look at, you start looking at all these countries, our government has been deeply involved in these countries and screwing them up. I mean, I was going to say it right now, we've done it. Okay? Iran, oh yeah, we've been involved there too. Who kept the Shah propped up back when there was a Shah, right? Converts in Iran face extreme hostility from their families and communities, and pastors are regularly arrested, prosecuted, and given lengthy prison sentences for crimes against national security. 
we hear that cry out here sometimes too, you know, kind of, you know, national security, national security. Really? We are that worried about national security. We do things a whole lot different. Pakistan, another lovely place. The country's infamous blasphemy laws remain a constant threat to Pakistan's beleaguered Christian community. All Christians suffer institutional discrimination. So if they go to do something, you know, officially with the Pakistan government, or if they need some help or whatever, they're probably not going to get it. Nigeria. In 2022. So that's the year of 22, because that was pretty recent. Terrorist attacks happened as far south as onto the state, with 41 Christians murdered in one church on Pentecost Sunday of 2022. It's 41 at one time. That's like us plus a couple extras, right? That was number six. Number five is Libya. Oh, another country we've been involved in. Hmm? Now, Libya had a dictator. Do we remember him? Muammar Gaddafi, you know, he was always dressed in some kind of weird white uniform with gold braid and ribbons all over the place that he gave himself, right? Third world dictator. Okay, but at least we knew who he was. But a previous president, Obama, and a previous secretary of state, remember Hillary? They tried this thing around the Muslim world called the Arab Spring. Remember that? Where all of a sudden we're going to have all these democracies pop up in, in, in all these, you know, Muslim-run, authoritarian, dictatorship-type countries. And none of them have turned out well. In fact, there's still a big civil war going on in Syria. We helped start that. Libya, we helped topple Muammar Gaddafi. We got some people killed, and there was a big cover-up. Right? Remember that? All right? Libya has no, still today, Libya has no functioning government. None. And it's primarily run, according to these guys, by Islamist terrorist groups, organized crime groups, and drug cartels, which they all go together. Christians in Libya are targeted for kidnap, rape, slavery, and extrajudicial killings. In other words, being executed outside of going to trial somewhere. Okay? These crimes are perpetrated with complete impunity, and Christians who convert who convert from Islam are routinely killed by their own families as a matter of honor. It's called an honor killing. Perhaps you've heard of that before, right? Or the dad will kill the child because the child has converted to Christianity. Eritrea, which is an African company. Eritrea only recognizes the Eritrean Orthodox Church, the Catholic Church, and Lutheran churches, along with Sunni Islam. Sunni is a branch of Islam, okay? So they recognize some Christian churches, you know, old school, you know, kind of European style or Eastern European style. However, non-traditional Protestant churches, like us, we would be a non-traditional Protestant church in their eyes if we were in Eritrea, are frequently subject to raids and members are in prison for long periods of time. Yemen, Yemen. I've flown over Yemen before. All right. Christians in Yemen are facing increasingly violent attacks and lengthy incarceration. They're kind of in the midst of a civil war and have been for a while. Okay. Converts to Christianity are vulnerable to physical and mental abuse, sexual assault, rape, forced marriage, and honor killings. Okay, Somalia. Oh, we've been there before too. Remember? 1993, Black Hawk Down. Right? George H.W. Bush says, well, we're going we're to go in and save these people. We have a UN mission. We're going to save these people. We're going to nation build in Somalia, which is a nation of warlords. Okay? Nation building doesn't work very well, by the way. We should figure that out. And then Bill Clinton became the president, and then we had the Mogadishu Black Hawk Down incident. Still a mess. Christians in Somalia, so number two, most dangerous place in the world to be a Christian is Somalia. Christians in Somalia face extreme persecution. They are explicitly targeted by the terrorist group Al-Shabaab and are frequently killed immediately upon discovery. Anyone found in possession of any Christian materials, including the Bible, is executed, often with the blessing of their family and community. Lovely place. And then there's North Korea. 
We all know about North Korea, right? Okay. They say that the uh, Republic of the Democratic People's Republic of North Korea mm. yeah. is unique because there is not even an appearance of religious freedom at all. In fact, in North Korea, you're supposed to worship the leader, the emperor, right? Kim Jong Un, right? Each one. This was this whole thing was started, I think, by his grandfather. I think his great grandfather, where whoever whoever the head cheese was was God, right? Notice all the predecessors to Kim Jong Un. They've all died. Some God, right? Uh, so for Christians in North Korea. Gathering to, together, like we're gathering together today, is nearly impossible. Okay? And they can only do it in absolute secrecy with minimal numbers. Let's get close to home. So that's the top ten. Let's think about close to home. Close to home. Latin America. Persecution in, of Christians in Cuba has seen it rise ten places. From number 37 to number 27. Remember, we're, make, we're supposed to be making friends with Cuba at this point. Nicaragua is in the top 50 most dangerous places for Christians to live. That's not very far away. Colombia, where we just uh, blessed and sent, you know, uh, the ripples back in the, with the Columbia Grace Foundation, ranks number 22. Up from number 30 as a dangerous place for Christians to be. Mexico, not too far away, right? Rose five places to number 38. Okay. What about the United States? Why, just at the end of January, there was a Christian public school teacher in California who refused to teach the whole LGBTQ transgender ideology agenda, and she was fired for that. Some of the news outlets have had the letter that the school district had the firing letter they gave her, and it's obvious they are discriminating against her. They are persecuting her and probably others for standing firm in their faith. In Canada, pastors have been arrested for holding church services when they were told they couldn't because of the pandemic. Right? In England, a woman and a priest. We're standing in front of an abortion clinic that was closed for the day, standing on the public sidewalk, praying silently. And when they were asked what they were doing, they said they were praying silently, they were arrested by cops in London. They've since uh, had their charges thrown out. But folks, persecution, even in Western society, it's beginning. We're seeing the beginnings of it. I think a lot of people are freaked out and upset by that. When you look at what goes on around the world, we're still pretty good here, right? As far as persecution goes. But yet, I think our faith is somewhat weak. Today, more than 360 million Christians are suffering high levels of persecution and discrimination for their faith. In 1993, Christians faced high to extreme levels of persecution in 40 countries. This number has almost doubled to 76 countries in 2023. Things are ramping up. It's becoming more and more difficult to even be a secret Christian in places in the world. Worldwide, one in seven Christians now experience at least high levels of persecution or discrimination. With one in five in Africa, two in five in Asia, and one in 15 in Latin America, which is on our doorstep. Okay? Okay? So even all this bad stuff is happening here, even here, Christians are being singled out in the United States, in Canada, Europe, Australia, okay? Christians are being singled out. The United States can no longer, we can ne no longer consider our nation a Christian country. People used to, I used to hear that, you know, when I was a kid, like in the 1980s. Well, this is a Christian country. Well, that was because the majority of the population of the United States identified themselves with one church or another, which really means they got baptized in that church when they were a kid, or maybe they weren't, you know, didn't mean they were regular attenders, right? That, that is no longer the case. 
We, as Christians, are now in our own country, which we once considered to be a Christian country, founded on Christian principles, right? Founded by the pilgrims who came looking for a place to freely worship you know, away from the Church of England. We are now in the minority. Okay. So, can you sit there today and still think that we are exempt from persecution? Or, perhaps the question should be, should we think we should be exempt from persecution? Because I think if, if we were suddenly faced with the persecution that Christians in China face, in North Korea and other places, I know if they didn't even mention China in this list, it's in there somewhere. How many of us would renounce our faith and how many of us would stand firm even to the death? I don't know. Only you can answer that. So what does Jesus say about persecution? I want you to open your Bibles, please. Turn to Matthew chapter 10. Don't worry, it's not all Debbie Downer. I just wanted to establish the facts. You know, facts are important. I used to have this kind of goofy friend of mine that I worked for for a while. His name was Bruce. And he would say things like, there you go, clouding the issue of facts. Right? Or truth is stranger than facts. Oh, Bruce. What a character. Can I get this out of my way here? Matthew chapter 10. We'll start at verse 17. Ah, I'll start with verse 16. Behold, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Therefore, be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. That's an interesting analogy he uses there, right? But beware of men, for they will deliver you up to councils and scourge you in their synagogues. You will be brought before governors and kings for my sake as a testimony to them and to the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it will be given to you in that hour what you should speak. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father who speaks in you. Now brother will deliver a brother to death and a father his child, and children will rise up against parents and cause them to be put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake. But he who endures to the end will be saved. When they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For assuredly I say to you, you will not have gone through the cities of Israel before the Son of Man comes. Interesting. Jesus is sending, remember, Jesus is sending the twelve disciples out. Okay? He's going to send them out on a missionary journey. He's sending them out in pairs to go to the little towns and villages ahead of him to proclaim his coming. And then after they get there, Jesus is going to show up. And he's going to preach and minister and, and heal in these little towns. And he's telling them, guess what? That's what's going to happen. He starts off by telling them, hey, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. Think about this. If you're a sheep herder, are you going to intentionally send your sheep into a wolf pack? No, because what's that wolf pack going to do? Going to try to devour the sheep, right? That's what wolves do. So he tells them to be as wise as serpents. That's interesting. After all, Satan himself came in the form of a serpent in the Garden of Eden. He's not telling them to be like the devil, right? He's telling them to be wise, but yet harmless. Right? Be smart about what you're doing. Realize sometimes people might be out to get you because you're a Christian. But do no harm. Has anybody here ever been attacked by a dove? Probably not. I mean, people sometimes get attacked by owls, right? Predatory birds. But doves are seen as gentle. And of course, in the New Testament, right? The Holy Spirit appears in the form of a dove, right? When Jesus is baptized. In the form of, okay? Or as or like, figure of speech, right? So we're to be wise, we're to be smart about what we do, and not go into things totally 
you know, headlong without thinking about it and not counting the cost. But yet, at the same time, when we're in the midst of the wolves, not only would we be wise, we'll also be harmless and gentle. We're not the ones to be going out on attack. Okay? And then he tells them to beware of men. Right? Because what are they going to do? They're going to deliver them up. Well, at this time in history, they're going to deliver them up to, you know, the, the ruling councils, the Sanhedrin. They're going to whip them. They're going to beat them in the synagogues. The little Jewish community churches would become a places of beatings at times. Persecution, right? And why? Why is why are so many why is why are so many in the world so I'm going to say the word hell bent, okay? That's, there's an old phrase, right? An old word that has that has a very strong meaning. It should to us, right? Why are so many in the world hell bent on persecuting Christians? Is it because they hate you? Or they hate our brothers and sisters around the world? No, it's because they hate Jesus vehemently. And we're seeing that rise up in our country today. Oh, I'm going to just come right out and say it. I'm going to put it right on camera and put it right on YouTube. Black Lives Matter. <clears throat> anti Christian, anti Jesus. Very much pro LGBTQ agenda. That's what that's all about. Read the website. I have. It's like, whoa. This whole push to groom our grade school aged children to question who they are, what they're made of, and to change their gender as if they were changing their socks. Wow. They're grooming our children for sexual perversion and mental illness. And we're doing that officially. Funded by us, the taxpayers. This stuff is happening here. And the more we speak up against it, the more they're going to push back. Well, guess what? I'm going to keep speaking up against it. It's wrong. And the only reason that they're doing it is to stand in the, you know, really in the face of God and go, yeah, we're going to do what we want. Mm. So what was happening then, and what was going to happen then, has now been happening for 2,000 years, and it's finally happening in our country. And I don't think we should worry about it. The reason we shouldn't worry about it is that Jesus told us it was going to happen. Right? Did he not tell us what was going to happen? Absolutely. We have yet to see, you know, a non-Christian brother deliver up a Christian brother in this country to death, at least not officially, right? Or a father's child or a child's father, but we're not far from it. And it's happening all over the world already. I mean, it's happening in reality, just like Jesus spells it out. And the reason is, and the reason that we are being hated, verse 22, is we're hated for His name's <coughs> sake. And then he says this, the end of verse 22, that he who endures to the end will be saved. We have to realize our time on this planet, in this body, is very temporary. I mean, if you live to be a hundred, there will be like a giant celebration for you. Right? At the nursing home. <laughs> I've been to those here in La Pine, right? Yeah, yeah it, it'll be a big deal. You may not remember it, but, you know, it'll be a big deal. Right? But shortly thereafter, you're not going to live much longer than 100 if you make it that far. He who endures to the end will be saved. We have to stand on our faith. Not in hateful spite of what the persecutors are doing to us. 
when Jesus was carrying his cross, when, when Jesus got arrested, right? Did he lash out? No. When they started beating him and telling him to prophesy, did he fight back? Like I might be tempted to do? No. When he drug his cross through the streets of Jerusalem, and the people were wailing and crying for him, what did he tell them to do? Told them to weep for themselves, not for him. When he hung on the cross, right? What did he say about forgiveness? He said, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He didn't say, Father, smite them, right? Nuke them. I always think of the Wizard of Id. Remember that Sunday morning cartoon, the Wizard of Id? Anybody remember that? Right? And sometimes in the cartoon, God would zap you know, somebody in the Wizard of Id cartoon. It was always a zot, right, with the lightning bolt. Right? Jesus didn't call for that. The disciples, the apostles, do we have any record of them fighting back against their persecution? No, we don't. We do not. All right, let's go to Luke chapter 21. There's a little bit more here. Luke chapter 21. The disciples are asking about the signs of the times and the signs of the end of the age. Starting at verse 7, he says, So they asked him, saying, Teacher, when will these things be? And what will there be? Or what sign will there be when these things are about to take place? And he said, Take heed that you not be deceived. Okay? For many will come in my name, saying, I am he. And they'll come saying, The time is near, right? The end is near. We hear that, we've heard that, I've heard that since I was a kid, right? There's always somebody out there on a cardboard sign. The end is near. Okay. Therefore, do not go after them. But when you hear of wars and commotions, do not be terrified. For these things must come to pass first, but the end will not come immediately. Then he said to them, so this sounds like world history, right? Jesus is going to give us a world history lesson here. Nation will rise against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. And there will be great earthquakes. We just had one of those in, in Turkey and Syria. There will be great earthquakes in various places and famines and pestilences. That's a disease. And there will be fearful sights and great signs from heaven. And there's all kinds of people out here right now who don't believe in Jesus, who are all freaked out that climate change is killing us. Everything's because of climate change, but they can't decide if it's getting warmer or colder. Right? Climate's always been changing people ever since the flood. But before all these things, they will lay their hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons, and you will be brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. We see that with Paul several times. But it will turn out for you as an occasion for testimony. In other words, that kind of persecution is an occasion for telling your story about how you came to Christ. Therefore, settle it in your hearts not to meditate beforehand on what you'll answer. In other words, don't worry about it. What are you going to say to somebody if they arrest you for being a Christian? What are you going to say in court? For I will give you a mouth and wisdom which all your adversaries will not be able to contradict or resist. They cannot contradict or resist the power of the Word of God. They can try to contradict it all they want, but truth is truth. And the Bible is truth. And what the world is teaching and telling, and what our government is pushing on our children and is pushing around the world is a lie. Or a whole lot of lies. Verse 16. You will be betrayed, even by parents and brothers, relatives and friends, and they will put some of you to death. This is happening in, especially in certain Muslim countries in our world, Pakistan being one. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but not a hair of your head shall be lost. I'm like, well, I don't have any to lose anyway. Okay? It's over right there. By your patience, possess your souls. You say, be patient, right? 
He's telling them to be patient. Here we are 2,000 years later. All the stuff has been happening, right? And it's getting more and more and more. And now the Western nations that used to consider themselves to be Christian nations, England, Western Europe, the United States, Canada, Australia, are officially turning their back on God and saying, we, the government, know best. And you Christians, we're going to marginalize you. We're going to fire you from your official government jobs because for you know separation of church and state garbage and stuff like that. Okay? Someday, they're going to come to us pastors, I think, and say, you can preach what we tell you you can preach. Just like Russia used to do, or the Soviet Union. They might still do it. China's done it. Right? The official state church. Germany, the official state church, believe it or not, is the Lutheran church. They're not preaching the gospel either. The Church of England, right? The official state church of England just come out and say, hey, gay pastors are okay. No, they're not. Because it's a sin. That's like saying, you can have an alcoholic pastor who's a practicing drunk and he can come preach while he's drunk. It's kind of the same thing. No, it's not okay. Last thing you need to see me drunk. <laughs> Everything you see going on, you read in the news, it's been happening since his resurrection. It's going to continue to happen until his return, and we don't know what that is. Do not cash in all your retirement now because, well, Jesus is coming back next week. You might as well spend it this week and have fun with it. That's been done. In, in American church history, kind of, right? It has been done in the early 1900s. People did that. Like, well, he's coming any time, you know? The World War I, okay, this is the end. So let's just have a good time. Well, guess what? We're still here, right? Okay, we don't know when that is. What we need to do is we need to pray that we will stand firm no matter the cost. Every once in a while, we will pray for the persecuted church around the world, which we will do today. And we pray that those people will stand firm. I think they're over there praying that we're going to stand firm because we're weak. In fact, I know they are. Because I've heard testimony of people from these countries who said, we pray for the Christians in the United States because you're all a bunch of sissies. You have no idea. Right? We need to pray that we will stand firm no matter what the cost is. Because far greater and grander is our eternal reward. Whatever comfort we think we have living in this country... It's nothing. It's all going to go away someday anyway. Someday my house will fall down. Hopefully not while I'm in it. Right? Someday the truck will disintegrate into a pile of rust. Hopefully not while I'm still owning it. Okay? What we need to do is we need to put on the attitude of Paul. I want you to turn the Bibles to Philippians chapter 2. We're going to finish up right there. Philippians. There we go, Ephesians, Philippians. It's right after Ephesians, in case you're wondering. Philippians, Philippians, Philippians. Wow. Philippians, I should have practiced that one a little bit. Alright. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 17, we'll finish up there. Therefore, if there is any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy... Fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, and who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. In other words, Jesus said, I'm going to take myself equal to God and become nothing, just like you people down here. Okay? Taking the form of a bondservant. In other words, like the form almost of a slave, right? And coming in the likeness of men, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. 
Therefore, God has also highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth, and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, which every person will confess that someday. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world. See, there's nothing new. His generation was crooked and perverse, and so was ours. Holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. This is a man who's faced all kinds of horrible persecutions and tough times, right? Look at his attitude. He's saying, yes, this stuff's going to happen, right? It was happening to him then. It was happening to Christians then. It's happening to us now. We need to hold fast, right? And we need to rejoice with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Verse 19, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ, but you know his proven character, that as a son with his father he served with me in the gospel. He's sending Timothy to them, right? He's commending Timothy. We send missionaries. We support missionaries. We, content, we commend them to wherever they go. We commend Mike, Riffle, and Stacy and those kids to the people of Columbia, which, by the way, is on the list of the top ten most dangerous places to be a Christian. We've got it easy. Because of that, we have it easy. We have church strife. We have people that won't get along with somebody else in the church because they get offended by something that's said. They get mad and they leave and they go to another church. I would think that if we were facing extreme persecution, we would probably set all of that aside. Maybe it's time for the church in the United States, in Canada, in Australia, in England, in Western Europe to begin to really face some persecution. I think it might clean us up a little bit. Not that I want to get picked on. Not that I want to end up in jail for preaching what we preach. or have, Not that I want to have our doors officially closed and we have to go meet in secret like we did the first few weeks after the whole COVID shut down a couple years ago. Remember that? Let's drive off in the woods and we'll have a, you know, an Easter service where nobody can find us. <laughs> where nobody will call the church and say, Man, there's five cars in the parking lot. That stuff was happening, by the way. But at that time was good for us. Wasn't it? Caused us to consider what are our priorities? What's really important? What's really important is our relationship with Jesus Christ. What's really important is putting others' interests before our own. That means maybe swallowing our pride Not getting mad at people when they offend us. I'm getting so t- so t- sick and tired of hearing that. I'm offended or triggered by this. I triggered something all right. I'm okay. I shouldn't do that. But it gets old. Nobody cares if you're triggered or offended. Deal with it. Right? It's kind of what Paul's saying here. Deal with it. Right? Deal with it with God. If you put others before your before yourself, and if you you know consistently do that, you're not going to be offended by people anyway. It's just going to be like, oh, okay. Does it does does your being offended at me 
impact my eternal destiny? No. No, it doesn't. Or am I being offended at someone else? Well, it might impact their eternal destiny if I don't deal with it correctly. Right? If I don't put them before myself, I could definitely affect their eternal destiny. As a pastor especially. Right? I could, I could you know, verbally rip somebody's head off and they could never step in a church again. They could totally reject Christ. And this happens. Right? So... We need to be united. We need to be humble, as Paul points out. And we bear the light. We are to be the ones, as he states here in Philippians chapter 15, that shine as lights in the world. And right now our world spiritually is dark. And what happens when people walk in the dark? They trip and they fall. Right? So what happens when people are walking in spiritual darkness? Can't see where they're going. Can't see that what they are doing right, to the next generation of children is destroying them. They fall, right? We're to be light that exposes that stuff. It says, hey, whoa. We've got to not be giving our kids puberty blockers. We gotta not be taking our young women and, and 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 giving them, you know, mastectomies so they can look more like a boy. Or vice versa, right? Because this is happening, right? And our government is pushing it. We gotta stand against it. We have to stand against it no matter what the cost is. More importantly though, we have to rejoice. We have to rejoice not just in the good times. We've got to rejoice in the tough times. We've got to rejoice. Because the end is near at some point. Right? The Father knows when, when Christ is coming back. And the worse things get in the world, and the more the world rejects God, the closer we get to that day, and we can rejoice in that. He is coming again. Rejoice. Or as the song says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say, rejoice. Okay, let's pray. <coughs> Father, we again, we thank you for this day. You've given us a beautiful day here in Central Oregon. But more importantly, you've given us your son, Jesus Christ. Who didn't call down fire and damnation upon the people who were killing him. He prayed for them. He prayed for their forgiveness. May we be able to do the same. In Jesus' name, amen. Mm -hmm.